I seen my lady home last night. Jump back, honey, jump back. I held her hand and I squeezed it tight. Oh, jump back, honey, jump back. I heard a sigh, a little sigh. I see the light gleam from her eye and a smile. Oh, flitting by. Hey, jump back, honey, jump back. I heard the wind blow through the pines. Jump back, honey, jump back. The mockingbird was a singing fine. Jump back, honey, jump back. And my heart was beating so when I reached my lady's door that I couldn't bear to go. Ooh, jump back, honey, jump back. Now I put my arm around her waist. Oh, jump back, honey, jump back. I raised her lips and took a taste. Ooh, jump back, honey, jump back. I love me, honey, I love me too, love me well as I love you. And she answered, cause I do. Jump back, honey, jump back. <laughs> My God is so high, you can't get over him, he's so low. You can't crawl under, he is so wide. You can't get around, you have to come in by and through the lamb. It One was day. either Alan Tate or John Crow Ransom, but I had met both of them. And one of them said to me, you've got to find an old guy as well as pay attention to the guys in your own generation. And I thought that was an unusual statement. And I thought, well, what does this mean by you've got to find an old guy? And then, of course, when I heard Margaret Walker v. Dunbar, it all became very clear. I thought, aha, there's my old guy. Mm. I've got to go back and learn how to read those dialect poems and those standard English poems in his voice rather than my voice and see if I can't bring them to, to life. And he sort of became my old guy. Swing your lady round and round, now do the best you know. Make your bow and promenade up and down the flow. Make that banjo hump herself. Listen to her talk, master's gone to town tonight. It ain't no time to walk. <laughs> Lift your feet and flutter through. Run, Miss Lucy, run. Reckon you'll be cotched and kissed. <laughs> Before the night is done, you don't need to be so proud because eyes are watching you and eyes are laying lots of plans for to get you too. <laughs> Moonlight on the cotton fields shining soft and white. Whippoorwill are telling tales out there in the night and your cabins cross the lot. Run, Miss Lucy, run. Reckon you be cotched and kissed before the night is done. <laughs> when I started to do the Dunbar, uh, he would mention songs. And then in some of the poems, like When Melindy Sings, uh, he clearly mentions uh, old hymns of the church like Rock of Ages and the spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot. But then he would uh, mention some of those uh, early uh, unaccompanied songs that uh, black people sang in the church. Go away and quit that noise, Miss Lucy, and put that music book away. And what's the use to keep on trying if you practice till you're gray? You can't start no notes of flying like the ones that rants and rings from the kitchen to the big woods when Melindy sings. Towser, you stop that barking, you hear me? Mandy, make that child keep still. Don't you hear the echoes are calling from the valleys to the hill? Let me listen. I can hear it through the brush of angels' wings, soft and sweet. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Sweet. Coming for to carry me. As Melindy sings. And so I thought it made perfectly good sense to either put a, a folk song or put a spiritual with a particular poem because they matched thematically. And so that's the idea that I worked with it originally. And it has proven to be a, a, a good marriage rather than a bad one, so. 
Dunbar and I have this agreement that where I get to do uh, one or two of my poems, and uh, and if he says no, then I don't do any more of his poems. And that'd be the <laughs> end of that. So, uh, so so far he hasn't said uh, no. So this is uh, my newest child. It's a collection of all five of the books which are now out of print. I'm going to read you a piece that uh, I wrote in Grand Rapids uh, because I acted once a long time ago in the uh, Grand Rapids Civic Theater in celebration. But I'm going to read you this poem because uh, the tech director took me way up into the uh, balcony of the theater because they, as I understand it, didn't know what that portion of the theater was for. We got up there and walked and walked and walked and the marble disappears and then it's just a wooden floor. And then there were church benches. And I no sooner saw it than I knew exactly what it was. It was where the black people sat when they were allowed to attend the theater. So they come in, I think, through the uh, alley or through the side door, and then they walk all the way up and up and up, and finally they get to the very top. And so I wrote this poem, and it's called Here, for Linda and Jim. Beyond the point where the exquisite marble left off, the wooden stairs in this old theater have become so narrow that only one body may pass. High above everything, only birds can speak. The air here is thin as frayed linens. A friend wants to introduce me to the silk presence she has felt. She has watched the dust flicker on these benches. I listen for the same sacred rattle, for echoes of laughter gone stale, of applause so old the bones crack. Light is muted here, ancient horrors in the settled dusk. It patches the worn floors where rejection hung like old humidity, unable to evaporate. Here, old neglect lies covered under a thin membrane of dust, waiting for the clean chance to infect again. Most, most poems are about memory or about an event that has taken place. And what you are really trying to do is create or recreate that moment as if it is happening for the very first time. Antigone, beer courses through me like a river, freshly through mountains or underground streams that break gently through the earth. The smoke in taverns aches my eyes. I watch a young man peruse his girl with his fingers. I think they will go out into the wind and accept the challenge of love. Otherwise, I shall write a million fantasies about leaves on water. Sit close to me, woman. Be next to me like a stab of pain in the heart. Rip my flesh. Love is buried in my bones. It aches to rise and become my skin, follicle and hair, frightened. Oh, the rush of love is pain. I'm always being, uh, at least paying attention to what it is I hear, what it is I see, what it is I smell, what it is I taste, what it is I touch. How do you know if it's going to be a poem or a song or a counterpoint poem? You, you don't know until you, you're working at it. You really don't know. I worked at a, a poem once when I was traveling in Italy. I worked on it all day long and oh, this was driving me crazy because I just, I thought, line for line, line for line, right down the page, right down the page. And it wasn't working. Something was wrong with it and I didn't know what it was. And finally, I put it aside and then went off to dinner. And for some reason at dinner, I opened up the book, and my notebook, and I looked down at it and I looked, boom, 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 boom. He says, oh, I know how this is supposed to work. And it was supposed to work like a contrabundal piece. 
It was supposed to work traditionally down the page, but it took me a while to pay attention to what the poem was doing rather than what I wanted it to do because I was, the poem was saying, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this thing. Boom, 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 boom. And when I, when I realized that I was paying attention to the poem and not to me, then the, the pieces fell into place. You wrote a poem several years ago that maybe you've already lived to uh, be haunted by, mm -hmm. by your students. The first line is, poor Martin, he went mad, you know. Yeah, yeah. Poor old Martin, he went mad, you know. His students report he didn't have far to go. He would often fly as high as the clouds with all them brains you'd think he'd know. A man can't breathe up that high. I ain't letting no amount of brains pull no stuff like that on me. Me, I'm keeping my roots on the ground like I was grass. Poor old Martin, I don't never want to be that free. Plato banished the poets from yes. the Republic because they were out of their minds. Right? Is that true? Well, they're not so much out of their mind. They're so close to the reality and the truth of what is going on that that is why they are banished. Nobody in the government wants to be told that they are doing things wrong uh, or wrongly. And so you get banished, and we still are doing it. You know, the, the poets who dare to tell the governments <laughs> that uh, this is wrong uh, get isolated, get imprisoned in their homes, or get exiled from the countries. Someone suggested to me that what Aristotle had in mind by the fall of the tragic hero was not so much ego, but getting too close to the truth. And yeah. you can't stand it, and, you, yeah. and you, it's painful. Yeah, it is painful. And that it, it sheds a light on uh, what is going on, what is happening. And poets' eyes and their sensibilities are like those Klieg lights and in the theater. And you turn those lights on and say, whoa, you know, this is too much. Uh, you get, uh, you don't want to be that revealing. You don't want that much to be revealed about you or to you, and so you have to do it in increments. We is gathered here, my brothers and sisters, in this howling wilderness, for to speak some words of comfort to each other in distress. And we chooses for our subject, and this we will explain it by and by. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses, and the man said, here am I. Now old Pharaoh down in Egypt, he was the worst man ever born. And he had the Hebrew children a down there a working in his corn. Twa the Lord got tired of his fooling, says he, I will let him know. Look here, Moses, go tell Pharaoh for to let them children go. And if he refuses to do it, I will make him rue the hour, for I will empty down on Egypt all the vials of my power. Yes, he did. And Pharaoh's army wasn't worth half a dime, for the Lord will help his children, and you can trust him every time. And your enemies may sail you in the back and in the front, but the Lord is all around you for to bear the battle's brunt. And they can forge your chains and shackles from the mountains to the seas, but the Lord will send some Moses for to set his children free and the land shall hear his thunder like a blast from Gabriel's horn. For the Lord of hosts is a mighty when he girds his armor on. But for fear someone mistakes me, I will pause right here to say that I'm a still a pretty ancient. I ain't talking about today. But I'll tell you, fellow Christians, things will happen mighty strange. Now the Lord done this for Israel, and his ways don't never change. And the love he showed to Israel wasn't all on Israel spent. Now don't you run and tell your masters that I's a preaching discontent. Cause I isn't, as a judging Bible people by their acts. As a handing you the scripture, and as a handing you the facts. Koso Pharaoh believed in slavery, but the Lord he let him see that the people he put breath in, every mother's son was free. And there's others think like Pharaoh, and they call the scripture liar. 
but the Bible says that a servant is a worthy of his hire. And you can't get round or through that. And you can't get over it. For whatever place you get in, this here Bible too will fit in. So you see the Lord's intention ever since the world began was that his almighty freedom should belong to every man. But I think it would be better if I paused again to say that I'm a talking about our freedom in a Bibleistic way. But the Moses is a coming, and he's coming sure and fast. We can hear his feet a trumpet, and we can hear the trumpet blast. But I want to warn you people, don't you get too briggedy, and don't you get to bragging about these things. You wait and see. But when the Moses comes with his power and sets us chillin' free, we will praise the gracious master that has given us liberty. And we will shout our hallelujahs on that mighty reckoning day when we is recognized as citizens. Ha <laughs> ha, chillin', let us pray. I think he is underappreciated. And that may be that, um, because he has spent so much time keeping Dunbar's poetry alive and a kind of self, selflessness where his own poetry is concerned. And most poets have so much ego that, uh, you know, every chance they get, a, get to read, they want to read their own work. But uh, Herb has, has sacrificed some of the attention that his work might have gotten because he, of his devotion to the mission of keeping Dunbar's work alive, and I think that's wonderful. The Dunbar uh, restoration was, is, is important to America, and so that has been work that, again, life being what it is, we're probably not going to acknowledge the importance. At some point, let me put English, Nikki, at some point there will be a statue in front of the Dunbar house of Herb Martin saying this is the man who brought this light to shine. That's what I'm trying to say. But things like that don't happen while you're here. <laughs> Herb's existence and, and his commitment to Dunbar reinforces the beauty of Dunbar and makes it live for us today and for all the, all the community in the nation. When you take on the persona of such a giant as Paul Ernst Dunbar, you could be asked to wear that, that, that mask 24 hours a day. Uh, uh, yeah. but, but the fact that he is an artist himself and what I get from his work is not only the reassurance that he's gotten from being blessed and anointed by Paul Ernst Dunbar, but also what he brings to his own, uh, his own work through his own life experiences from Birmingham to Ohio. Uh, uh, so so I, I, I find uh, a lot of joy in his work and, and the best part about it is that when he speaks through his own voice, his own voice is just as distinctive as Dunbar's voice. I think he has had some influence on how, how well-known Dunbar's work is, and I think that that's been important to him. And it wouldn't just be, I think if it hadn't been Dunbar, it would have been someone else. But for him, I think he connected well with Dunbar and it worked really well for him. But I think he's, you know, kind of proselytizing when it comes to literature much of the time, but I think he does it in such a way that kind of sneaks up on people, you know. People, people come who don't necessarily expect to enjoy what they see and they enjoy it. We've known each other quite a long time. I want to ask you if you remember the night we met. Yes, I do remember that <laughs> night or that afternoon. We were in uh, Toledo, Ohio at the University of Toledo. They had this uh, writing conference going on and it had been organized by Noel Stock. They were all talking about poetry and I thought they were talking about, supposed to be about contemporary poetry and they were talking about modern poetry. The people from uh, Pound and Eliot and their generation. So I thought that there was a two separate things and <clears throat> that they hadn't focused very much on the contemporary poetry and they were leaving out people like uh, Charles Olson and Robert Lowell and, and a host of other people. And so I got up and said something outrageous and arrogant as to, you guys don't know <laughs> much about contemporary poetry at all. You're talking about modern poetry and we've moved beyond that. And um, 
as I remember, you, you included uh, this is why you're turning off young people because you're out of touch. Yeah. And at that point, the audience went into thunderous applause <laughs> at your objections. Yeah. And so we wanted to meet this person who would take on, but it's not quite like you. You're very gentle and you're not, you're not quite as explosive as that usually. Yeah. So, I don't know what made me do that. And I don't know why I. Uh, but it seemed to me that. In part, they really were not talking about contemporary poets. They left uh, Allen Ginsberg out and Corso and that whole beat scene, and they had left out uh, all of those people uh, who seemed to follow Charles Olson, and 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 they seemed to have been the thrust and force behind the contemporary movement of poetry and how you put it down on the page. And so I thought, I thought, well, maybe we ought to at least address this. Uh, in, 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 and I thought, I, I don't know why I was being so mean-spirited. <laughs> well, uh, we began to learn about your work at that time, and I think that was 1971. Shortly thereafter was the Dunbar Centennial. That's right. Yeah. And so how did you and Dunbar get together? Dunbar and I got together... Um, Early on, I looked so much like this man in my childhood that, that I resisted it with a, uh, a force that, that I don't any longer have. But uh, I, I got over that and sort of forgot about it. I was teaching African-American literature, and one day the book simply opened at uh, Dunbar's uh, portion of the, the book. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to be a hundred, or he would have been a hundred next year. And so I started organizing um, a centennial where I invited all the poets that I knew or thought would be able to come. And a lot of those people showed up in Dayton, even though I didn't have enough money to pay for all that. Uh, they came and, and they gave uh, three days of performances on the weekend. And so that's how that took Be, place. Before that, when you were a child, people wanted you to recite his work. Probably. Yeah, and, and partly because I looked like him. Right. And I had those uh, horn rim glasses. Uh, and um, At that time, Dunbar was a little out of favor in some cases. Yeah, he was out of favor and, and partly because of the dialect poems. I don't right. think that many people wanted, uh, certainly in the... 40s and the 50s to be associated with dialect because that hinted of not being intellectually astute or clever or knowledgeable. So nobody wanted to touch dialect at all. So you found yourself teaching at the University of Dayton, too? Yes. Out of my office, I could look out the window towards the Dunbar's grave. <laughs> And uh, I thought, this is really, you know, kind of eerie. After uh, the book had opened to the page. The, the after era. the book had opened to the page. And we've had that kind of crazy connection uh, over, the, over the years, I thought. Uh, um, sometimes when things are going rough, I go to the grave and say, see here now, <laughs> help me get this thing done. And, and, and almost invariably, it happens within a week or two that the problem is solved. And, Were you very um, surprised so many people came to respond yeah, to you? Yeah, I was really kind of amazed because there must have been a kind of underground swell uh, there always about Dunbar and people may have been reading him secretly, people may have wanted to know something more about him, <clears throat> wanted to know whether these young poets uh, knew anything about Dunbar at all. And fortunately for me, um, Margaret Walker came. My mother read Dunbar to me before I could read it for myself. And that I have been influenced by Dunbar all my life. And I had been invited, I'm an Ohioan, I was living of course in, um, in New York. But, uh, and I would have gone, I mean, don't misunderstand, I would have gone for her, but I've known her forever. But uh, they said Margaret Walker was gonna be there, and it's like, oh my God, I mean, I'm such a fan. And that's when I met, uh, that's when I met Margaret. And I, I find myself wondering where to start, because I like so many of these poems. 
and she just was absolutely uh, thrilling. You know, I could not believe how well she read Dunbar. They had a great big party down the Toms the other night. Was I there? You bet. I never in my life see such a fright. All the folks from four plantations was invited, and they come. They come trooping thick as chillin' when they hear the fife and drum. And, uh, and I thought at that point I had to go back and learn, relearn the dialect again because I'd forgotten it. Mm. Uh, we moved from the south to the north, and with that change, uh, I was completely converted uh, into uh, standard English, and that was all I heard. And, um, and so I had to go back and, and... I remember being there and seeing her say, see here, you folks, this is the way you read Dunbar. Yes, and, yeah. Because I think that, um, and, and I'm not calling any names, but a few of us really uh, had learned the standard English so well that we'd forgotten how to, how mm -hmm. to say the dialect words. And it's merely a, a matter of pronunciation. You have to figure out how to say that word, and then it, it's very clear what it is you're talking about. Now, my granny is going to visit him, and I seen her get her shawl when I was hiding down there behind the garden wall. I seen her put her bonnet on, yes, I did, and I seen her tie them strings, and honey, I is going to dream it about them cakes and things on the shelf behind the door. Oh, my God, what a feast. Soon as she gets out of sight, now I can eat in peace. Cause I've been watching for a week, just here for this here chance. And when I get in there, I is surely gonna do oh, lemon pie and ginger cake. Let me set and think, vinegar and sugar too. Now that's gonna make me a fine, fine drink. And if there is one thing that I love most particularly, it is eating sweet things, oh honey, and drinking sangaree. Now I won't pull Granny Rare when she see the shelf. When I thinks about her face, now nah, it's most shame of myself. Well, she is gone, and here I is back behind you. <gasps> Look over here, my granny expected me. There ain't no sweets, no more. Every sweet is hid away. Job is done up just brown. Person would have thought that somebody thought that there was thieves around. <laughs> that just breaks my heart in two. Oh, how bad I feel just to believe that my own grandma believed that I would up and steal. <laughs> <laughs> a little boy, little boy, yes ma'am. Did you go to the fields? Yes ma'am. Uh, did you water my cows? Yes ma'am. Uh, did you feed my lamb? Yes ma'am. A little boy, little boy, yes ma'am. Uh, did you go to the fields? Yes ma'am. Uh, did you gather some corn? Yes ma'am. Uh, did you take it to the miller? Yes ma'am. Did the miller make flour? Yes ma'am. Did the miller make flour? Yes, ma'am. Did you take it to the cuckoo? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you take it to the cuckoo? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did the cook make bread? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, did the bread taste good? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How long did were you in the South? How long did you grow up in the South? Uh, Twelve recall? and a half years. I was there, okay. and um, I was born there and. Uh, Grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. and then about 1948, around December, we moved uh, to Toledo, Ohio, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's where I started <clears throat> to go to high school. And I mm -hmm. thought I was going to go to junior high school, but I only had one more year in the eighth grade, and and so they said, no, let's just send him right on off to high school. Uh, and so I went to high school uh, and started in the ninth grade and finished there. When we enjoy your works and read your works, we like to know what some of the early influences are. So was there, were there your father, your mother? Your well, family? my father read uh, detective stories. I think you could buy those, those uh, paperbacks for something like 25 cents in those days. Uh, and my mother, she, they all told stories, the old uh, folk tales around the, the fireplace. And uh, those kinds of things. Um, sort of uh, got underneath my skin and, and, you know, in my blood. And so I knew that when I went to uh, high school, I read uh, all of the English poets 
from from uh, the seventeenth century, the Romantics, the, and and into the nineteenth century. So all of those people were important. And um, Are you still avoiding Dunbar then? Yeah, I was still uh, well. I wasn't so much avoiding Dunbar. He had disappeared from the textbooks, mm. and uh, and in fact there weren't any. Um, black writers in the textbooks in high schools. Uh, now, there were in the South, but uh, we'd long been past that. And so I didn't see any black writers in the high school textbooks at all. And I didn't see any black writers in any books until I went to college and I'm in a sophomore American lit class. And they opened the book and I said, oh my goodness, yeah. there are black people in this book. <laughs> and I said it out loud without even thinking about it. And um, the teacher who had edited the book said, of course there are black people in that book. They are very good writers and they should be in that book. But, you know, in those days you didn't tell the teacher, oh, well, I haven't seen any black writers all through high school, so how was I to know that there were black writers out there? You know, this was at the University of Toledo. Yeah, this right. was at the okay. University of Toledo. And uh, G. Harrison Oriens, I remember his name, had edited this uh, two-volume set of books on American literature. And people from Phyllis Wheatley to Dunbar were in there. And then came the uh, Harlem Renaissance, Claude McKay, County Cullen, Langston Hughes. All those people were in there. It was just amazing to me <laughs> that, that suddenly there were black writers who had written and had gotten into the English text. Your mother was a big influence. There's, a, there's an important woman voice in your poem who yeah. speaks often. Yeah. Could you talk about that a little well, bit? Well, you know, I think that she was one of those strong individuals um, that said, you, you've got to uh, keep doing this. You can't worry about being exhausted. You can't worry about being tired. You can't even worry about being sick too often. You've just got to get the next thing done and the next thing done. And you put one foot in the other, uh, in front of the other, and you go on. You don't just, oh, I don't feel so well today. Well, so what? Lord, child, I done told you a million times them words you is fooling around with don't make no sense. Them words is the devil's work. You better leave them alone, you hear? Here you sit from morning to night writing down what you think is right. Who ever told you you had the right to decide bad or good? It ain't worth the time of day less than it's going to bring you some silver, and I don't see how that's possible for anybody to be paying you for something you done scribbled down like chicken scratch. <laughs> And don't go telling me nothing about what or how much money white people make. You ain't white, and I don't want to hear nothing about no fame. Attention ain't no good when you dead. Don't make no sense. Furthermore, it don't make no never mind how much you scream or how long and woolly you let your hair grow or how many baths you refuse to take. If you ain't got no money, you ain't got nothing to say. And I didn't have to go to no fool college to learn that. I done been walking through this world and learning since I knowed exactly who I was. So if I tell you a hen's dip snuff, search for the box. Boy, where is you going? I'm talking to you. You better come back here and listen. Lord, Lord, these children are going to be the death of us all. Not that we ain't giving them plenty of kindling wood. I think those women's voices are a composite of all the women that I ran into in the neighborhood and in the church. And so I've just sort of put them all together because in any one time you will look at mothers in general and you'll find uh, that protective streak, streak that's in them. And they want to make sure that uh, everything is going right for their children. And they're very defensive about that. So I think in that sense, uh, it's I'm writing about uh, all mothers instead of one particular mother in terms of the voice of the poem. This is about a, a, a church mother and a young girl. And the church mother wants to know what's going on in the young girl's love life. And she's not about to tell her. <laughs> 
I seen you down in church last. Never mind, Miss Lucy. What I mean, oh, that's all right. Never mind, Miss Lucy. <laughs> you were smart as smart could be, but you couldn't hide from me. Ain't I got two eyes to see? Never mind, Miss Lucy. Guess you thought you was off a kick. Oh, never mind, Miss Lucy. Everything you done, I see. Never mind, Miss Lucy. Seeing him take your arm just so when he got outside the door. Honey, I know that man's your bow. <gasps> never mind, Miss Lucy. <laughs> Say now, honey, what he say? Oh, never mind, Miss Lucy. Keep your secrets, that's your way. Oh, never mind, Miss Lucy. <laughs> Won't tell me, and I'm your pal. I'm gonna tell his other gal, cause I know her too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and her name is Sal. <gasps> never mind, Miss Lucy. <laughs> it seems to me that it's not self-indulgent in some way it's just part of who he is that he loves to be on the stage and he loves to perform and he connects with audiences and audiences connect with him and you know I, I suppose if you know if you have a really great um, singing voice or you can really dance that you're probably motivated to share that with people when we came north I didn't know about it but my mother sang and once she joined the church choir. She tells the story that she went, um, I guess, to audition or to join the choir. And, um, and somebody, one of the men said, my goodness, uh, this lady can sing soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. <laughs> and, so, and I was amazed at the range that my mother had. And I think that that's what he was referring to, that uh, she had a pretty large range. And I think in some ways I may have inherited that. Uh, and then I went off to study with a lady in Toledo named Amanda Baxter. And she, she really sort of trained the voice so much so and so well that I think it's lasted all these years because mm -hmm. I think many days I think the voice is wearing out and then I fall back on uh, Mrs. Baxter's technique and then I think oh well you know she really did a good she knew what she was doing but I didn't know uh, but but yeah it's plenty lasted. good room plenty good room good room in my father's kingdom plenty good room plenty good room why choose one seat and set down no plenty good room plenty good room good room in my father's kingdom plenty good room plenty good room why choose one seat and set down Oh, glory to the Prince of Peace, he clothed himself with clay. He entered the iron gates of hell, and he took his old sting away. Oh, plenty good room, there is good room, so much room in my father's kingdom. Plenty good room. There is good room, I've just to choose your seat and sit down. Thank you. Do you still get nervous after all these years? Of How do you prepare? You try to rehearse, that's the first thing, to make sure you are familiar with uh, the material. And I remember when I was doing plays at Toledo, the director says, the one thing you need to know about is what's on that stage and where it is you're supposed to go. So you should check the stage every night before you go on. That's your business. You shouldn't worry about whether somebody else checks it. You should check it to make sure, one, there's no nails there. <laughs> there's nothing in the way of where you're supposed to be. Uh, and that you do that in a religious way. So I, so now I, uh, that's in my system, in my body. So I, I check my manuscript 
to be sure that all the poems are in the right place. Uh, I check my mind to make sure that the songs are in my head. Uh, and I check to make sure that the songs are vocally somewhere in my throat so that when I have to do it, I am prepared to do it. I can't start pre preparing or rehearsing when the performance is there because that's already, already too late. Since men will not mourn the cruelties the body endures, the heart grows older. The brain is difficult to live with. Pieta, whose milk is sorrow, feeds the body with comfort. The fount runs dry in her arms. No sun aches the eye like grief. Those men who die hungry have sought an independence, a wrenching of soul from stomach. Death is an entrance from war. You don't know when the tongue is going to uh, trip you up. You don't know if the eye is going to read the words on the page. You don't know if the memory is going to become faulty and fail you at a key moment. Uh, so you have to always have your nerves uh, wound to that point where they are tightest. And then when you, uh, and I usually go out on stage thinking, oh Lord, here I am going to make a fool of myself again. And then once I go out and I see the audience, I think it's no more time to worry about that because that could happen or could not happen. But I am there to deliver some kind of product to this audience who has taken their time in the morning, afternoon, or evening to come to hear me. And so I ought to be about the business of reading as well as I can. He always says it's a disaster. He says it every time. <laughs> Okay. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent, it's always a disaster. So, But you know, sometimes people will come up afterwards, if it's something local, people will see me and say, oh, I just so enjoyed his performance. And so I know that it's not, you know, sometimes it must work out all right. He had his dream and all through life worked up to it through toil and strife. Afloat forever before his eyes, it colored for him all his skies. The storm cloud dark above his bark. The Calm and listless vault of blue took on its hopeful hue. It tinctured every passing beam. He had his dream. He labored hard and failed at last. His sails too weak to bear the blast. The raging tempest tore away and sent his beating bark astray. But what cared he for wind or sea? He said, the tempest will be short. My bark will come to port. He saw through every cloud a gleam. He had his dream. The University of Toledo has been an important place for you. Yeah. Uh, you went there, you left there, yeah. you went to New York, you came back, yeah. and all kinds of accolades and your collection is there. What, what happened in Toledo? I think I was not as mature as I should have been. And I, there were semesters I'd buckle down and other semesters that I'd coast through. And it just didn't, it just mm -hmm. wasn't working out. And I thought, okay, uh, why don't you just strike out on your own and see what you can do? And that's when I left. The long journey, I started out in Colorado and I studied uh, that summer with Carl Shapiro. And then, uh, and I had a working scholarship to Breadloaf. And so after Colorado, I, I took the bus. <laughs> I rode all the way to Vermont. And uh, I waited table that summer and uh, had a critique with John Frederick Nims. And that got me started to writing. And I was learning a lot from both those people about doing imagery. And, um, and, and that took me into New York, and I thought, I was that close to New York, I was going to go and stay there. And I had made uh, reservations at the 34th Street Y for a week, and I had $5 in my pocket. <laughs> and so I thought, with just sheer blatantness, I just went on into New York. And I spent that week looking for a job. And I finally found one on, I think, the third day in the afternoon. 
And the next day I went to work at World Publishing, working in the mail room and cataloging everybody's manuscript that got, that came in and then got rejected. Uh, and I would look at it just to, to, and I would write it down in a huge uh, dummy book just to make sure that we hadn't rejected uh, something that became a bestseller. As I was doing that, I um, figured out how to work, and then I went to the uh, Lutheran church, and every Sunday they had a, a Bach cantata being given. And so I joined the choir and, and sang in the uh, choir for many, many years. Uh, and then I decided that if you could understand Bach, the SATB, and all those groups singing together, that perhaps you could write a poem uh, and have two voices, and that it would make perfectly good sense. Uh, and I called them contrapuntal after Bach uh, and the sense of counterpoint, because you have two voices running counter to each other. Um, I wrote six of them, and, uh, and I gave them to a friend of mine. By that time, I'd moved to Buffalo and uh, was doing other things besides going to graduate school. And he said, they work every way but one. And I thought, wow, I'm out of the box that I painted myself into. I'm out of that corner now. Uh, so, so Fred Redding opened it up to another way. This is how it works. And do you wonder why we came to touch so close, fearing neither kiss nor embrace, hungering between two worlds? In those last two months, I found an allowance of courage to drive my image straight. And do you wonder why, in those last two months, we came to touch so close? I found an allowance of courage, fearing neither kiss nor embrace, to drive my image straight, hungering between two worlds. Hungering between two worlds, fearing neither kiss nor embrace, we came to touch so close, and do you wonder why? To drive my image straight, I found an allowance of courage in those last two months. Hungering between two worlds, to drive my image straight, fearing neither kiss nor embrace, I found an allowance of courage we came to touch so close in those last two months, and do you wonder why? <laughs> I applied to Columbia, and they said, with your two years, uh, three years, we'll give you two of them, and you can do two at Columbia. And, uh, and then I wrote to Toledo, and they said, yes, you can come back here, and you can have your degree in a year. We'll set it up so that you do this amount of courses for one month, a semester, and then this amount of courses for another semester, and you will be done. And I wait two years, one year, two years, one year. Uh, I, I, in, in truth, I should have taken the Columbia option, because then I would have been in New York forever. Uh, but for some strange reason, I thought, two years, when am I going to get that much money? And I made some money, and I could go back to Toledo and do all the coursework and not have to work and finish it off in a year. And so I decided that I would go back to Toledo, where I'd started, and finish it off and get it out of the way. What was different at the University of Toledo when you got back? Uh, there was one, a new dean. <laughs> 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 who didn't terrorize everybody, white or black. Uh, and uh, there were some teachers there who had sort of, they were young then, who had watched and thought that I had some ability and some talent. And when I came back, they were interested in making sure that... Uh, I learned the literature and learned the language, and then that I learned all the poetic devices. They put their careers on the line by saying, this is what you've got to do. So you get back to Toledo and finish, and then you started. And then I got a, a fellowship, um, 
And that was crazy because everybody who was graduating in English that year uh, had fellowships, but I didn't have one. And I, I read poetry religiously. And I opened up the, the, and there was an ad from the State University of New York at Buffalo that says, if you have published 10 poems, would you apply here and you might receive a fellowship in English? And I thought, that's kind of crazy. But uh, I thought, well, I published 10 poems. <laughs> so I applied and uh, they gave me a fellowship. And I was really sort of delighted and happy about it. But at the same time, I, I thought, they can't possibly mean this. And so I called them up before I was supposed to appear and said, are you sure you know what you're doing? And they said, yes, Mr. Martin, we know perfectly well what we're doing. And you have a fellowship and we expect to see you in September. So the next thing done for you, you went to Aquinas College. I yeah, I, I uh, got out of Buffalo and I got a job uh, teaching at Aquinas College. And... Um, they were very gracious to me, and they gave me a job, which I thought nobody's going to give you a job, but they did. And uh, I taught there for uh, three years, and I acted in uh, Under Milkwood by uh, Dylan Thomas, and then I did a musical, Finian's Rainbow, with them. And I had great fun. And, uh, and Dayton was... Luring you? How yeah. did that happen? Well, uh, I was I was deciding that I was my life was going to be three years at one university, three years in another university. Mm -hmm. The first university was Catholic, so I thought the next three years ought to go to the Protestants, and then then the next three <laughs> years ought to go to the nonbelievers, and then maybe three years to the Jews. And so, then uh, how long did you stay at Dayton? Well, I stayed at Dayton because my mother. Uh, strong as she was, says, why are you hopping around from university to university? And I said, oh, well, you know, I had this plan to go here and here and here. And she said, well, are the people in Dayton nice to you? And I said, yes. And uh, they're good to you, yes. They're giving you raises, yes. Why are you moving? <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So I cast my lot with, with Dayton. And so now we're back to Dunbar, and pretty yes. soon, how did the, your signature performance was your Dunbar one-man show? How did that get started? Somebody said, why don't you do a performance of Dunbar? And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll uh, put this program together of African-American spirituals and Dunbar poems, and... Uh, the uh, department announced it to everybody, and lots and lots of people came. And that sort of floored me because I was amazed that uh, in that city there was that, that kind of groundswell and interest in Dunbar. And that sort of when it began, and from that moment on, it sort of taken off. You know, I was teaching, I would teach my students how to read the dialect. And then they would go off and teach at other schools. But then they would ask me if I would come and read Dunbar. And I said, no, I already taught you how to do it. But they were still skittish about it. And they said, would you please come and do it? Now, folks ain't got no right to sense other folks about their habits. Cause him that give the squirrel the bush tail, he made the bobtail for the rabbit. And him that built the great big mountains, he hollowed out the little valleys. And him that made the streets and the driveways, he wasn't ashamed to make the alleys. <laughs> we is all constructed different. There ain't no two of us the same. And we can't help our likes and dislikes. And if we's bad, we ain't to blame. And if we's good, we needn't show off. Cause you bet it ain't our doing. Mm -mm, we just get into certain channels that we can't help pursuing. But we all fits in the places that no other ones could fill. And we does the things we has to, big or little, good or ill. Now, John can't take the place of Henry, and Sue and Sally ain't alike, and Bass ain't nothing like a sucker, and Chubb ain't nothing like a pike. 
Now, when you come to think about it, how it's all planned out and splendid, nothing's done ever have that is something that's intended. And I don't care what you do, you have to, hoo -hoo, and it surely beats the dickens. So, Vadi, go put on the kettle, because I got one of Massa's chickens. <laughs> Oh, the fox went out on the chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light. He said, many a mile to go this night before I leave this town. No, oh, well, the town, no, oh, well, the town, no. Oh, many a mile to go this night before I leave this town, no. Oh. Well, oh, mother flip flop flop jumped out of bed. Out of the window, she popped her head. She said, jump. The gray goose is gone, the fox is on the town, oh well, the town, oh well, the town, oh, John, John, the gray goose is gone, the fox is on the town, oh. I can go now to the black community, and I could have done it 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, and people recite Dunbar. People still know Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Across the board, and, uh, across faiths and indeed across uh, races. Uh, Dunbar was read by uh, everybody in the uh, uh, years that he published. But it's going to be Dunbar who's going to change how we look at ourselves. And it's going to be Dunbar who's going to say, come here, little brown baby, and sit on my knee. And previous to, to Paul Ernst Dunbar, little brown babies were pickaninnies, gator bait, and that would be the nicest things that could be said about him, right? And it's Dunbar that's going to change that. And in changing that, you know, we recited Dunbar in, in church. You know, you, Dunbar it, it was major. He wasn't um, just uh, somebody in, in the black community. He was uh, an American original, shall we say. And he was in everybody's homes. So in the 70s, you were doing the Dunbar Show. You were also publishing many books of your own yeah. and performing your own poems. Yes. How did you balance out the Dunbar and Martin? Well, you know, I, I, I will give my body over to him for an hour or two. And then when, when we uh, walk out of the theater, uh, I'm her Martin again. And, uh, and that's fair enough. Uh, he gets that hour of concentration and concentrated delivery, and then when that's over with, it's as though we close the book for a while, go home, and do our own work. And, uh, and so I was trying to write uh, many, many poems, not to be, uh, shall I say, taken over by Dunbar, but writing poems in my own voice and finding that voice and developing it and remembering uh, Dudley Randall, very famous publisher and poet, said, you have to be careful about the dialect so you don't end up in the same trap that Dunbar did. And so I thought, mm -hmm. okay, so I can write uh, good standard English poems and I can write good dialect poems and not concentrate on doing too many of one or too many of the other. Before I leave this town, there's one thing you ought to know. The first time I said I loved you, I was as honest as the summer's warm. In a manner of speaking, that's crazy man's talk. What other way does a man bleed the full moon without seeming foolish? He acts. If a man follows his heart, the journey is difficult. The fool that watches what he eats is wise. I didn't bring you no flowers, didn't come to say goodbye with no gold. Woman, on your rough road, I grew old. Lost years like few men ever do. My ache all come from loving you. It all come from loving you. I ain't gonna associate with no white gal. I ain't gonna associate with no black gal. Don't you think no red or yellow one will do neither. You women are all the same. Vanity's your game. That's the first thing I'm gonna tell you for a change. Next I'm gonna look in the mirror and see myself fine. Get me some fine black walks, some slender zippers, and some bright buttons. Then I'm going to exhibit. I'm going to get in all the windows for you to look at. Let you drool, wag your greedy tongue, lick your red lips, roll your eyes, then let the window dresser pull the drapes because my price is too high. An audience can sometimes tell you where the poem really ends. Uh, and I think uh, once when I was reading uh, The Lady Has Her Say, um, the audience said, the poem really ends here. And I had maybe another stanza of, of lines. 
and I read on afterwards. And the laughter was not as, as hysterical or hilarious as it was right in the middle of the poem. So I went back and I thought, okay, here's where the poem ends. Listen to me, Woolworth man. Who you think you needs a stowboat boy that's got a price tag on his leg? Who you think's anxious to possess a pretty toy? Me? Huh, your thinking is mighty wrong. I want a real strong man with life in his craw who understands what it takes to give, who feels the pulse to live, who can generate heat all through my house because I'm a sweet meat mama that don't do nobody's crying, who refuses to spend time lying and don't have to waste no time trying because my strawberries are plump and red and sweet throughout. So go right ahead, take a train, fly a plane, hop in a car, double, triple the distance, make it four times as far. Don't hesitate for my sake, Stobart man. I got you at the five and dime. I was going off to uh, Breadloaf to the School of English, and I uh, started working on a Master's of Letters. And the only reason why I did it was because it says M period L I T T, and I thought that would look really kind of cool behind my name. <laughs> and so, can you imagine going off and doing a degree because uh, you have that? Those those letters and they're different from anybody else's. And then you wanted another degree. After yeah, that after too. that, so. and then I went off to Carnegie Mellon, and thinking that I could get this whole thing done in a year and a half, and they offered a DA, which is a Doctor of Arts, mm -hmm. and I had a BA, an MA, MLIT, DA, and I thought, okay, why not? Uh, B -a -ba -ma -da. <laughs> I was uh, going into my senior year and he was there to do a doctoral degree. Uh, and I saw him on campus, and I, I, this is really true, he had this big, huge white shirt with really puffy sleeves. I think it was a, he said it was a French butcher shirt. So I actually saw him on campus a couple times in this shirt. And then in the fall we were in a class together. So we were in a poetry class with uh, Paul Zimmer. So that's how we met. And so did you start reading each other's poetry or something because it was a workshop or what? We, we all had to bring poems in and his were right. clearly better than everyone else's. So, um, you know, than your garden variety undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon. So, so when did it go from uh, working as a fellow poet to a romance? We started the date somewhere that first semester. And that so was uh, 77? It was the fall, uh, the fall semester 77. 77. And then I graduated in 78, yeah. Okay, and you were married in 79. Yeah. Quietly, I woke up this morning, looked at you sleeping next to me. In the bathroom, the electric light cut between me and my mirrored image. I relieved myself, showered, and as I washed, I thought of last night, of our struggling in the grip of love, of our winning the struggle, of our relaxing triumphant. Immediately, I rinsed the soap away, returned to bed, and touched you quietly. We share poems sometime with each other, uh, and uh, we look at each other's work, and it's not a terrible thing where one thinks I'm better than you are, though I really do think that she's better at it than I am. But I just do it, uh, you know, in a kind of methodical way. I keep at it. And we were so, talking about your work in the community. Now, there's a community, two poets together, and you have kids and you yes. have grandchildren. Yeah. How do all those communities relate? Well, they all come together. We, we work at it. Uh, that's what we have to do. And to keep it going and to keep it alive and survive so uh, everybody has something to do at some particular time, some chore, and while somebody else is away teaching, uh, somebody does the meals and that kind of community. Uh, somebody takes uh, people to daycare and to childcare or to school in, in the mornings and picks them up in the afternoon and everybody gets back home around the same time. So this person that the audience is in awe of in performance is thinking about what time he has to be at daycare tomorrow. Yeah. 
Always. I asked her, she said that you were, uh, wanted to win the Nobel Prize, and I said, besides the Nobel Prize, what else does he want to do? And she said, well, I think he'd like to be Pope. <laughs> <laughs> the people he likes best in the world are children and grandchildren. He teaches me to pronounce things and... So what what are you thinking of doing then? I mean, because it's like you're following in his shoes in some ways. I am. I want to be. I want to take over. I want to be my grandpa. Having a famous grandpa means I get to go to his um, performances and. You you enjoy the performance. Yes, I do. I want to write books. I want to be an author. What will you write about? Uh, Insects, friends, songs, schools, houses, trees, nature. All the night, oh, it is a rock and all night, talking about a rock and I'm sure that in her mind it would have been nice if I were a lawyer or a doctor or something like that because those professions in those days seemed uh, to mothers and fathers reputable but also a way to earn a living and you didn't have to work as hard as they thought they had worked. So that was one of the reasons I think that she sort of wanted uh, or even be a teacher, but certainly not be a writer. R writers are in some ways like actors. <laughs> you, you know, they're near to wells and who knows whether you're one you're going to be famous or uh, make a reputation or even be able to earn enough money to live on. But somehow she saw you wanted to do it and encouraged you and helped you. Yeah, she you. saw that, that that was where it was going and I think um, I don't know if she so much pushed as she resigned herself to it, and this is this is what he's going to do. But I see him heading towards uh, teaching, so we'll encourage that, and maybe the writing and all that other stuff will die on the way um, or on the wayside. So I don't know. That's what I think, um, and she she didn't dis encourage the writing and she didn't disencourage my publishing in those early days and and when the poems got accepted I think she was as much excited about this little scribbling that I'd done that somebody had taken and put in their magazine as I was so in that sense it was okay and I think when the first book came out uh, that was okay too and she sort of celebrated it and uh, at least mentioned it to her friends. My uh, son has a book, and the title was too long for anybody uh, to remember, so she just said, my son has a book. That was the first book. Um, the second book came along, and I got this brilliant title, and, um, and I thought, well, that's what the book should come, because I had two epigraphs uh, that helped to solidify it. And then later, uh, after my mother objected <laughs> to the title, I found the third one, and that solidified it for me. I thought that it, but when I told her I'm going to publish this book and it is going to be called this, she said, you can't call the book that! <laughs> and uh, so... I was a little bit disconcerted by it. I thought it's a clever title, uh, and um, so one was from Richard Wright about if it wasn't for those police and, and those police dogs, there wouldn't be nothing but uproar down right. here. And Eldridge, uh, Eldridge Cleaver, Cleaver yeah. lifts a line out of Norman Mailer, and the line goes, "I say after Mailer, there's a shitstorm coming." I thought, wow, I thought those three names, that's really a good title. 
And I have got to name my next book that, The Shitstorm Poems. Well, when I told my mother that, she was appalled, uh, conservative to say the least, and, and, and a little bit on the right, I suppose. She didn't want, you know, you can't go around in public saying things like that. You might in your own home, but, uh, but certainly not in respectable public. But then I, I remember there was a spiritual, and it goes, been in the storm so long, been in the storm so long, been in the storm so long, just give me a little time to pray. Been in the storm so long, been in the storm so long, children, been in the storm so long. Just give me a little time to pray. And I thought, yeah, that's what the spiritual's about, and that's sort of what my book is about. And the book came out, it's doing quite well, and I always sent her a copy. So I took her copy home and I put it on the kitchen table and I left. And I came back and she was talking to one of her lady friends on the phone and she said, and my son has published a second book of poems. And that's all she would say about <laughs> it. So I thought, okay, and she never gave me a hard time about it. Uh, she never questioned it. You talked about your father earlier. What what else? What other kind of influences do you remember from him? We came north, and he worked in a foundry, and we stayed um, together for maybe a year, a year and a half, to two mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. and then uh, my parents separated. And uh, my mother and I went one way, and I guess he went the other way. And for many, many years, they were separated like that. Uh, from time to time, he would uh, uh, show up when my mother was ill. And uh, I never questioned their separation, because I didn't... Mm -hmm. In those days, that wasn't the child's business, to wonder why these people mm -hmm. aren't together. So I just left it alone. And uh, he never remarried, and my mother didn't, although I think after they were completely separated or divorced, uh, she had contemplated it, but, uh, and she asked me if I liked the gentleman that she was thinking about marrying. And I thought he was a very nice, gentle, quiet man. And so I said, I don't have any problems with him. He seems nice enough to me. And, uh, and if you want to marry him, that's fine. And I think for some strange reason, within a month, he died very suddenly. And uh, I didn't talk to her about it at all, what she felt or how... Or, or any of the repercussions from any of that, I don't know, uh, to that day. And I've always imagined there was a short story there uh, uh, I that I should write. We were, we're going to write about uh, it. Right and it, it, it's way in the back of my mind. Every once in a while it comes to the fore, and I put it back safely in its little cubby hole <laughs> at the door. Uh, so I don't know. Who were some of the major poets who influenced you? Well, I think uh, clearly people like uh, Langston Hughes, uh, clearly people like Robert Hayden, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, but clearly poets like Frost and Cummings uh, were there. Uh, some poets who are not, shall we say, remembered any longer or are getting into the vital uh, anthologies like Louise Bogan. Um, uh, Marianne Moore was there. Uh, you can't just uh, say one is more powerful than the other, but using uh, disparate elements from borrowed from everybody, male and female, white and black, uh, goes into helping you to construct 
and make poems. You know, poems sometimes turn out better and sometimes turn out worse and things get published or they don't get published. And I kind of think in the long run that's irrelevant. Um, I think he writes some really amazing poetry and that the reason he does it, he, he'll tell you this, is the, that it, it's the same reason he breathes, which is he has to. You know, and I've heard other artists say that as well. It's like not a question of, you know, would this be nice to do or will it look good or, you know, will somebody like it or will somebody pay me for it? It doesn't have anything to do with okay. it. It's, you know, it just has to be done. How do you discover when a poem's going to be a soft poem or an angry poem? I guess you have to listen to the tone of the poem because when we, we talk to each other, um, sometimes the, the tone is way up here and then other times it's way down here. Sometimes it's mean and, you know, it's almost as if the, the tone has uh, locked its teeth and locks its jaws, and so you know that it's not a pleasant tone. Uh, if you can hear that tone and divine which way it's going and how it's uh, working towards its own conclusion, and you follow that, then, then the poem is likely to tell you much more than if you dictate to the poem and tell it, I don't like you because you're mean and spirited. So, so the poem yeah. said, well, you don't have to like me, you know, and, and it goes somewhere else and finds somebody that does like that tone. Uh, so you have to... Someone sort of, else writes your poem. Then. Well, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> ideas go to innumerable writers and to, in the hope that it finds the best writer. Herb has the, has the capacity that many black poets don't have. During the um, uh, black arts movement, you could read an angry poem and uh, see this little man standing in the middle of the page shaking his fist and you'd say, oh, he sure was angry, wasn't he? A good poet would take that anger and the, po and the person who read the poem would be angry. They called him nigger. Easy enough for white folks to say. They wrote him blacker than hate because he did not shuffle to their dreams. Oh, easy enough for white folks to do. Animal, they said, the occasion suits. Easy enough for white folks to say to a simple man who took eyes and saw, stop nigger, you ain't got no business being on top. I saw that man take refuge in his arm, soul, strength. I dare say it was not easy enough to do, white folks. I saw that man wrestle time, score, and you in his single passion to imagine he smelt the rage, he suffered the strife, he dealt with the anger too. That's a part of living, I heard a mother say. Oh, it ain't easy enough, white folks, and that's the gospel truth. That's always the difficult thing is to find the right metaphor, uh, the right combination of words, the right combination of sounds. Uh, all of those things uh, trigger something in human beings, other human beings, and makes them uh, say, oh yeah, I never thought of it that way. Oh wow, that's what I'm supposed to do, you see. And then you get them on that uh, road to that which is righteous or that which is godlike. Uh, he went to the Baptist church when he was a kid, and you know, he ended up at, in a Lutheran church as an adult, and then he joined the Catholic church. And I, I really think it doesn't matter which church he's in. And he went to Saturday school with the Jewish family his mother worked with. I think. Like, you know, his spirituality is unchanged by all of those experiences in some ways. It might be fed by it, but it's not changed by it, so. What is the transcendent? What is the divine in your work? Well, I was talking to a poet this morning and I said, you know, you have to talk about God and the divine without using those words. Because the minute you use those words, you think you are on safe ground. Uh, you have to prove what it is you're talking about by logic rather than just handing the person the word. They'll say, well, what does this mean? You know, or they'll say, this, this word is so heavy, this word is so profound that y you should be able to 
garner something from that. No, you want the person to look at it first and see uh, D-E-V-I-N-E and do it one letter at a time or G. Oh, D, and do one letter at a time and figure out meaning uh, incrementally and, and not be struck over the head by having somebody yell out, God, or divine, you know. Okay, okay, I'm, I've been bad, so what do I do now? You know, you, you want to uh, seduce them if you can or intrigue them if you can. How do you feel as a writer about critics? I'm comfortable with whatever it is that they say. Uh, I don't always get good reviews, but that may very well be because I haven't left all of the right clues uh, in the title or in the book themselves, uh, even though I thought that I did. And so, um, so the critic misses the point. Now, if he misses the point in all the clues are there, I don't worry about it because I think, well, I put all the clues there and he or she should have figured out that this thing leads to this thing and this thing leads to that thing rationally and logically. And so I don't uh, get upset and I don't rush to the the height of the house and throw myself off the rooftop because they missed it. <laughs> If he had not been self-sufficient, he wouldn't have survived as, a, as an, an artist. And I think okay. a long time ago, he decided that he would be self-sufficient. And I mean, I think there have been times when I thought if he had a good reader, he could take it to another level. Um, but I don't think he lost any sleep over that opinion. <laughs> have the critics or readers sometimes found things that you had no idea were there and you like to hear that? And yeah. Uh, sometimes a poem is doing something that you, as the writer and as the poet, simply do not know, and uh, it's telling you all the time that this is why I need to be this way. And so if you haven't tuned into it, and sometimes the critic tunes into it and says, oh, this thing uh, is working this way because such and such and so and so. The light bulb comes on and you say, oh, I would, oh, that's why that was supposed to be that way. And so that's okay. Uh, it's good to have people looking over your shoulder and saying, you know, why don't you try this thing rather than that thing? Uh, that's not a terrible thing. What they're doing is helping you uh, to become a better writer or a better performer. You can't be a poet or a critic and think of your career in the contemporary moment because the good work is going to come when the next generation comes to look at what you've done. Your contemporaries are looking at how would I have handled that and so you, you, you need some more space and I think that you continue to work in other words for the future. Well, what's driving me is to uh, make the next best poem that I can make. Uh, that's one thing. And to uh, find uh, a real performance that intrigues me. I'm sometimes more of a critic than I should be, I think. But I still, the only thing I, I mean, the thing that I said before, I think he's, I think he's the real deal. Freud thought that most art was a result of a kind of madness, right? If we mm -hmm. repress things mm -hmm. and it comes out. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be any art if there wasn't neurosis. Yeah, yeah. This is probably true. You know, we, we write out of uh, sadness. We write out of pain. The poet is trying to look at that sense of what it takes to be a human being and what it means to be a human being. And so we are interested in the horrific more so than we are interested in that which seemingly is, quote, happy, close quote. Why do you think uh, there aren't more happy poems? Like on the day you got married, you were very happy. Why wouldn't you write a great celebration poem? I don't know. Aren't we intrigued by uh, the devil in Beelzebub in, in Paradise Lost more so than, than the good angels? Blake said Mil that Satan was the hero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I find when the angels and the devils are uh, fighting with each other and uh, 
one side starts picking up boulders <laughs> and throwing them at the other side. I think that's just terribly funny and humorous, you know, and that Milton could pull that off in the midst of this huge epic poem is is one of the strokes of his genius. How do you reconcile that you're going for the divine and yet as a poet you're an instrument of the devil? I don't know. I don't I don't know if I, we are the instrument of the devil. We're just looking at those things which are a little bit dark and saying maybe this is not the way to go. You know, uh, beware this road because it will take you into dire trouble. Oscar Wilde says poetry is the art of lying. Well, I would say it's the art of um, imaginative lying. That is, what you're, what you're doing is you get the kernel or a glimmer of an idea and that you have to shape and put things around that glimmer of an idea until it is, becomes a complete picture or a complete whole. And, uh, and so you don't know which is fictive and which is real. But if you are in any way a master of the, whatever it is you're doing, then you can't divine that little spark that, that gave you the idea and that little piece that you invented around the idea. John Charty said it's, you get that glimmer and then it's 99% uh, sweat and hard work that you put around that glimmer to make it shine so that, and make it gleam so that you don't really know where that idea came from. Now, sometimes I could point to a line, but sometimes I can't any longer because time has merged the two things together. And, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's like Yates says, how can you tell the dancer from the dance? You, know, you can't because they are both together and the one becomes the other. If you don't want to come, go and tell your mammy there ain't no hammer that's on this mountain that ring like a man, boys. That ring like mine Dun bust these rock boys From here to Macon All the way to the jail, boys Yes, back to the jail You jack o diamonds You jack o diamonds I know you of old boys, yes, I know you of old. You robbed my pocket, yes, robbed my pocket, done robbed my pocket of silver and gold. Whoa. If you don't want to come